This is week four of this series we've been walking through called Mouthy, a, a series where we've been learning to own and unleash the power of our, our own words. And uh, it, it's, it's been a pretty, pretty practical, pretty convicting series, at least for me. It's, it's been based on, on a rule that we found the Apostle Paul gave us, this, this verse here that he wrote. The Apostle Paul was one of the first followers of Jesus in the, in the early days of the church, and he wrote these words to give the Christ followers something that they could grab onto. Now, the interesting thing about this verse is that even if you don't believe God, that God exists, even if you don't believe that the Bible is even God's word, you could probably understand that this is a good rule to live by. So just to review, I'm going to read that out. He says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what's helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit... Those who listen. Now, this, this word build, we were looking at that last week. And I just want to, I don't want to reca- recount the, the whole series, but just last week, let me summarize. Last week, we saw that this word build refers to building a house. So what Paul is saying is that everyone you meet it, on the street, it could be friends, it could be family, everybody is building like a mental house for them to live in, and it's built with words. In other words, the words that are spoken to us and the words we speak to ourselves, we're constructing a view of the world and reality through which we're viewing and making decisions and all kinds of stuff. So the, the crazy part about this is it's that mental picture, it's our mind that is the house that our heart lives in. In other words, it's, it's the thoughts that you're thinking, that you're walking through the day with, the words you're, you're telling yourself, the words that people are telling you, that are actually creating the environment in which your heart will either thrive or shrivel. So this is huge. So when we're speaking words that cut people down, we're actually creating a negative environment for their heart, and we're causing their hearts to shrivel a little bit. But when we build people up, when we use words of truth and love and grace, we're giving people a place for their hearts to live that's, that's, that's full of life and truth, right? Now, we, we also agreed that everybody's under construction, so, so me included, the pastor included, all of us are under construction, our houses are under construction, we're all a piece of work, we're all a few bricks short, we talked about that, we ha ha ha, but, but it's true, we're all a few bricks short, and, but I think one of the things we all need to also recognize is that our construction project actually isn't going very well. Like, so there are times in which we think we're, we're doing pretty well, and our life seems to be going well, but how often do you wrestle with thoughts? that are negative towards other people, negative towards yourself, thoughts of worry and anxiety and all kinds of things, bitterness, anger, regret, shame, all that stuff that we're trying to keep at bay. So that's what I mean. If these walls could speak, they do speak. The walls of this mental house we're, we're, we're building, it's constantly speaking to us and either killing or building up our hearts. So what we saw Jesus do last week is apply this this kind of triad. We watched him with a guy that came to him wanting help building his life, building this house, this mental picture. He says, I don't know how to build an eternal life. So he he came to Jesus and we watched Jesus start with what was already there. So he's building on what the guy already had in his life, but then he spoke love into what was missing and then he let him choose what to do with it. Remember that? We talked about that last week. Now, what the cool part about this is, is that watch, watching Jesus, what we're seeing is, this is how God relates to us. So now I want to take that picture frame. Instead of talking about other people and talking words of life or words of death to other people, we're going to flip that around. and We're going to talk about the words we speak to ourselves. So this is how God deals with you and me. You're under construction, I'm under construction. We're a piece of work. He's already begun the process of trying to help us grow into a better kind of person, grow into a person that puts our faith more fully in Jesus, a kind of person that builds the world instead of tearing it down. And so he starts with what's already there. He speaks love into what's missing in you. And then he lets you choose what to do with it. I pointed out that every single week, that's what's happening as I speak, right? Hopefully, God's speaking love into what's missing, and he's letting you choose what to do with it. What I want to talk about today is that choice. 
What do we choose to focus on? This is going to be really, really practical. So as you're choosing these words, there are some principles I want you to keep in mind. When Jesus walked the earth, he actually had a lot to say about building. Building was, was on his mind. And so as we're building our lives, he said, here's something to keep in mind. Now keep, keep this in mind. When, when he walked the earth, not everyone was convinced, just like today, that he, he was the son of God or that he had any kind of authority to speak into anybody's life about anything. He was some backwoods carpenter that started get, got up one day and started speaking and doing some miracles and collected a following. And then he said stuff like this. He said, everyone who hears these words of mine, notice we're building with words again, watch. Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. So the rain came down, and the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell with a great crash. So it's one thing to come to, let's say, a church in, you know, A.D. 33, or, or a hillside preacher, and you're listening to this guy speak, and you think, you know, he's got some pretty, pretty cool stuff to say. No, that's really wise. That's really, that's good. I'm going to grab that. I'm going to use that in my parenting. I'm going to use that. And then Jesus takes it up a notch. He says, so here's the deal. If you want to thrive, you've got to build your life on me. Did he just, did he just say like, Build your life on me? Yeah, and my words. So if you want eternal life and you want to thrive in your life, you're going to have to listen to what I say and do it. That's a pretty audacious statement. Right? Like, who who says that? That, That's crazy. Who even says that? Listen to me and obey me. And we still struggle with this today. We, we treat, we treat the, the stuff we read in the Bible kind of like a buffet. And, and some people, some people don't take very much of the buffet because they only read the stuff they like and, and the stuff that really tastes good. And, and then they just like, eh. it's like when you go to the salad bar, they're not assuming you're going to take one of everything, right? Like they put, they put stuff there. I'm sure some of it, they just put there. It's probably plastic. No one eats the stuff. They just want to make it look like it's variety, you know? Look at the, look at the spread, <laughs> you know? I, but you, you clearly go, yeah, boo, that's not going on my plate. That, ooh, that's, mm, I'll take some of that. No, nah, mm, maybe not today. And you, you, just, you do this with, with food, and this is what we do with Jesus' words, too. Even the most committed Christ followers in this room do this. Because there are words in here we do not like. Jesus says, you've got to build your life on me and the words I speak. You have to let me call the shots. And we struggle with that. The people of Jesus' day were no different. And they, they, the words Jesus spoke weren't just teaching. So, so they watched him speak words like he would bless food, this little kid's lunch, and it multiplied and fed a whole bunch of people, thousands and thousands of people. Oh, they like those words. Those are good words. Good word, brother. Speak that one. Yeah, say that again. I'm going to hang out with this guy. This guy's good, right? And then, and then Jesus comes along, and there's this kid. He's thrashing on the ground. He's got a demon inside of him, and he, he speaks words, and the demon comes out. And you're like, good word. Love that word. That's a good word. I like that word. Keep saying words like that, you know? And then there's somebody who's caught in adultery, and he says that she's forgiven, and she's set free, and he lifts the shame and and the guilt from her with words, and they're like, oh, I love those words. So good. So good. Can I write that down? That was, say that again. What did you say? And then he would turn around. He'd confront their hypocrisy. They don't like those words. And he would confront injustice. He would call people out on their junk. They don't like those words. Hey, enough of that. Too much. Too much. The thing about Jesus is that his words are always full of grace and truth. It's not like sometimes the words are super helpful and they're gracious, and they're, they build you up. And other times he's like, nope, I'm pull- <laughs> no grace for you. And he goes in, and he just hits you with truth. 
there, there's always grace and truth. He wraps his truth in grace because all of his words are meant to empower us. All of his words build us up. All of them. They just don't always feel like they do. <laughs> now, the disciples of Jesus had, had this moment where he was, he was building a crowd. This is the, right after he took the little kids' lunch and blessed it. They really liked those words. They're hanging out to see if there's dessert coming or I, like because it was just a great day. Thousands of people, like, what's it going to be? I'd like to see tiramisu for 5,000 people. That'd be awesome. <laughs> Bam! You know, does he have spoons? Because that will be really messy, you know? How's he going to do that? I don't understand. So they're, they're just, they're hanging around Jesus, and then he flips it around, and he starts speaking the truth into their lives, and they're like, whoa, back up. Give me the fish, give me the loaves, give me the tiramisu, but that, I'm not going to swallow that. And people start leaving by the tens and the hundreds and the thousands. They're, they're leaving. They just saw an amazing miracle that blew their minds, and they got a free lunch, literally, the world's last free lunch, and they, and they start walking away to the point where Jesus turns to these 12 disciples, and he says, well, what about you guys? You going to leave too? And Peter turns to Jesus, and he says, where else are we going to go? You've got the words of eternal life. Well, after that miracle, Jesus also grew a different kind of following, a kind of a critical following that became very threatened by his miracles and his teaching, the religious elite, and they started putting pressure on him. And a day came when Jesus was arrested and grabbed in in the middle of the night in the garden and whisked off to be tortured and beaten and killed. And his disciples, who the same guys, he said, well, where else are we going to go, took off just vanished into the night because they they were so afraid of being associated with Jesus. They had just been so committed to, no, you're the foundation. I'm going to build my life on you. Yep, yep, if you build your house on the rock, it won't get knocked down. That's me. That's totally me. They're out. And then as Jesus is tortured and beaten and and lifted up on a cross, they start trickling back. They start trickling back around Jesus. And by the time Jesus had risen from the dead, he found them where they had run to, and he gathered them together again. And and he he reinforced this, this truth. Again, you've got to build your life on me. And these guys that started by saying, where else are we gonna go? They meant it. All of them, except Judas, all of them came to a point where they said, not only are you gonna be the foundation of my life, I would rather die then build my life on anything else, on anyone else. And all of them, except a few, actually proved it with their lives. They would rather die than build their life on other words. So, every single one of us have to wrestle with this concept. Who is calling the shots in our lives? Whose words are we building on? The same guy, the Apostle Paul, again, who's a second generation follower of Jesus. In other words, not just the original 12. This is a guy who came on later and met Jesus in a different way. He said this. He said, by the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder and someone else is building on it. He's talking about building the church here, but he's also talking about other kinds of building projects. Look, but each one, each one should build with care. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. And if anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, straw, in other words, you're building your house, you're building your life on these ideas and these theories about how life works and all this stuff, all the words that are going to define you, if you're building on this stuff, your work will be shown for what it is because the day, there's a day coming that will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. So in other words, it says here, each one should build with care. Be careful how you build. The reason he's saying this is because here's how we tend to build. This is how I tend to build. I tend to collect words around me that I want to hear. I collect the nice words. I collect the words that make me feel good. 
And most of the word, words that just make me feel good are only half true, which is why it's not building on a good foundation. The other part of this is we have an enemy who's also giving us bricks to lay in our foundation and building into our walls, the walls of our house. And these words are words of condemnation and, and, and lies and deception and, and all kinds of things that steal and kill and destroy what God is trying to build. And not only that, we're not very good at receiving advice on how we're doing. I said the building project's not going well, but nobody wants to admit it. None of us. We're like, yeah, I'm good. I'm fine. You've been wrestling with your thoughts all day long. How are you doing? I'm fine. You are not fine. You are in a battle for your soul, and you're, no, I'm good. Fine. You know, I had, a, a, I had an art teacher when I was in grade, like grade 7. I took an oil painting class in, in grade 7. There was a special class for special people, I guess. And I, I uh, here, Brad. <laughs> Take this class. So I was, art, I was really artistic, and I, 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 I picked it up really quick. I'm, a, I'm kind of a natural sort of artist. And so uh, she, would, she would give us a painting, like we're going to paint this picture. And then she, we had our, our canvas and then our paints and our brushes and everything. And she'd get us started, and then she'd hover. And she'd walk back and forth, and she'd give us advice on our painting and stuff. And, and I'm super stubborn. I'm really, I really like to, I'm independent. I like doing things myself. And so I'd be working away, and I remember this one painting. There's like a mountain. There's a classic with the mountain and the lake and the birch tree. You know that one that, with, that you, you learn in every art class? So um, it's the friendly bush and the, and the happy trees and all of that. that <laughs> That was the painting we were painting. So I was working on my, on my, on my birch tree, and, and you use this palette knife, like, kind of like this, to, to create this birch look. And she came by, and she says, yeah, that's pretty good, but here's what you want to do. And she took the, the utensil out of my hand, and she painted on my painting. So I could just, I could just, my, I could just feel my ears going... It's growing. I'm like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. thank you so much, the art teacher. And then she walked away, and I grabbed the thing and made it, fixed it back to the way I wanted it. Because, like, because, because, if I'm be honest, by then, and I'm sure if I look back now, it wouldn't be quite this true. But by then, I was convinced that I was a better artist than she was. And so, who is she to tell me how to? You wrecked my tree. So, so I didn't respect her as an artist. So it was really hard for me to let her tamper with my painting. See, but I think all of us need to come to grips with the fact that Jesus is not that shoddy art teacher that doesn't quite know what he's doing. He's the author and perfecter of our faith. He understands. This is the guy who walked on water, raised the dead, healed the sick, the lepers, the blind, the lame, and he's split eternity in half with his death and resurrection. He has the right to speak into my life and your life. So we need to figure this out. Who is going to speak into our lives. Who gets the last word? Who gets the first word? Who gets the last word? We, we need to come to this point where instead of going everywhere else but Jesus, we come to where the disciples were and saying, where else are we going to go? You've got the words of eternal life. And to take it a step even further to go, and you know what? I would rather die than base my life on anyone or anything else. Now, what I want to spend the rest of the time with, and, and don't worry, it's not too long, is I want to give you a, a, just a framework to show you how to do this. So this, again, the same guy, super useful, super helpful guy, the Apostle Paul, shows us how this works. And, and, and for some of you, this is going to be review. Some of, it, some of you is going to go, no way, that is so practical. You'll be able to run with it, and your life will change if you take this, okay? So, again, we're going to start by building on Jesus. So this is 2 Corinthians 4, 6, and 7. And Paul says this is how it works. God said, let light shine out of darkness. That same God who created the heavens and the earth, he made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ which means we have now a treasure inside of us. So if I've given my life to Jesus, I've come face to face with him, his glory comes to live inside of me, this light, which is a symbol for truth, and it starts to radiate out from me if I'm building my life on Jesus. And this, this, this is an all-surpassing power, so it gives us the power to build the kind of life that we're, we want to build, and, but it's from God and not from us. So th there's the foundation. Now, what, what I want to show you 
is, is what happens next. When Jesus is in that core, when Jesus takes that place as the light of your life, as the foundation you're building on, this is what we struggle with, and this is what happens. Watch this. Very next section. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. The first thing that I want you to hear this morning, and, and, and really, think about this. There is a difference between what is happening to you and what it means for you. There's a difference between what is happening to you and what it means for you. And what Paul's doing in this verse is he's pulling the two apart. He's saying if you're in Christ, you've got a power within you to understand that what happens to you isn't what it means for you. Now, the reason he's got to do this and the reason he's got to delineate this is this is where our minds go. Our minds go, I'm, I'm under so much pressure. Our minds go, I'm crushed. When, when, we're, when we're perplexed, we're confused, we're wondering, we immediately go into despair. When we're persecuted, when we're, when we're attacked, we, we think we're, oh, no one loves me. I've been abandoned. I'm all alone. When we get knocked down in life, we think, oh, this is it. I'm toast. Our minds immediately go to the worst case scenario and give us a meaning, attach a meaning to it that is not helpful. And they have help. Our minds have help. Just before this, he's talking about the God of this age, little g, which is Satan, who's blinded people's minds who don't believe. So as we don't believe what Jesus says, we are blinded to the truth of who we are and our circumstances, and we come to the wrong conclusion about what's happening to us. There's a difference between what happens to you and what it means for you. So some of you experience something horrible in your life. Something was done to you that's made you feel less like you're worth less because of it. Some of you have made mistakes and your conclusion has been now I'm disqualified or God, won't, I can never quite get back to where I was. See, there's a, there's a difference and we need to pull these apart. We need to pull them apart. It's so, so important. So here's the first thing. We need to do what this verse says. We need to say, yes, I have been knocked down. So this is not a denial of reality. In some churches, they get you to deny reality. Nope, 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 I'm good, I'm good. No, you're not good. You got knocked down. The problem is that we jump to what it means being worse than it really is. So we say, yes, that hurt. Yes, I, I, was, I was hit. I was backstabbed. Yes. But no, that does not mean I'm alone. No, that does not mean I'm disqualified. No. It's really quiet. Can I get, like, some feedback? <laughs> is, this, is, this, is this resonating at all? You can go, yeah, but no, yeah. It's just, hey, good. the whole good word thing, that was a hint. You can do that. That would be good. Um, good point, Brad. Thank you. Um, so first thing we do is we say, yes, this is real. This happened. But no, I refuse to let Satan define what it means. I will not, because then I'm building my life on his foundation instead of the foundation of Jesus. So then he goes on. Look at this. He keeps going. He says, therefore, we do not lose heart. Outwardly, yes, we're wasting away. But inwardly, we're being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen, since what is, te what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Yes, it's been a really tough week. Yes, it hurts. No, this does not mean I've been abandoned. In fact, I am being renewed on the inside, and I'm being transformed to the image of Christ, and God has a plan, and I'm in it, and he's going to use this for his glory and my betterment because he loves me. Thank you. That's good. 
Now we're, see, and you know what? You know, this isn't just for me. This is, this is what's coming out of this passage. Your response to the words of Jesus determines how they take root in your life. So a passive response to the word of God does not change you. The more you respond in the affirmative, so this is what Paul's doing. Yeah, man, we've been struck down. I've been, I've been shipwrecked. I've been, but no, that did not mean God left me alone. In fact, God is using this for his glory, and I'm secure, and I'm loved, and I'm justified, and I'm approved, and I don't have to please anyone because I've been released from that, and I, I'm, I'm victorious because Christ is victorious, and he's, he's affirming the positive. You see how this is not just take a negative and flip it into a positive. That's, that's just like pie in the sky stuff. This is way different, way different. So this is where, this is where I want to go, I, I, where I was, I was like giving it to you before. This is, this is why, okay? So this is it's like talking about truth and love and all that stuff. There's grace, there's truth, bam! Okay, so here's, here's why I say it's important to respond. The piece in between these two verses that I, I skipped over says this. It is written, I believed, therefore I have spoken. Since we have that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak. Because we know that the one who raised Jesus, the Lord Jesus from the dead, will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. Don't just think it, say it. Even in the, in the principle of just, this is how education works. Teachers know this. You remember things when you say them. When you're studying, don't just read. Say it. Say it out loud. Hear yourself say the words. And, and this, this the principle applies in the spiritual realm in a powerful way too. We're, we believe it. If you believe it, say it. You need to hear yourself say the words. So you don't just sit there and your hard time going, man, this has been a really hard week, yeah but I'm not abandoned, I'm not, and you're just thinking it, say it, say it out loud, speak it, declare it, it matters, you need to hear yourself say the words, declare the truth and keep saying it, now, I've been saying today that the most important voice in your life is the voice of Jesus, do you know whose voice is the second most important voice in your life? Yes, your own your own voice, resonating with the voice of Jesus. When Jesus speaks his word into your life, the most important voice after that is your voice saying, I agree, yes, and coming into agreement with God, resonating with the power of heaven so that we can release the power of heaven in our lives. That's the most important thing you can do with the truth. And then you start walking it out. The best sermons I've ever preached have not been to you. They've been in the mirror. (laughs) They've been in the moments when I'm walking through my darkness, when I've had to wrestle with my own doubts and my own anger and my own bitterness, and I've got to say, yes, that hurt. Yes, that was a backstab. But no, this will not define me because I am secure in Christ. Because I'm loved and I'm forgiven and I'm approved and I'm, I'm dignified by what Jesus did and nothing can change that. Those are the best sermons you will ever hear. And they're the ones you need to speak to yourself. And declare to God and declare to the spiritual realm, to anybody who's listening, that this is where your foundation is. Period. Um, I mentioned that this isn't just the power of positive thinking. That this isn't just to turn that frown upside down. (laughs) Don't worry, be happy. That's not what this is. I want to show you, it's right there in the verse, where is this anchored? It's not anchored in positive thinking or just wishing well. It's because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. It's based on the resurrection of Jesus. It's based on something that was already accomplished. He died. He rose. And if there was ever a moment when something needed to be reversed, it was when the Son of God was lying cold in the grave 
alone, rejected, defeated, in the dark, sealed behind the tomb. It looks like it's over. So yes, he's dead, and it looks like it's over. If there was ever a time when you could go, yep, well, that's it. You roll the stone in front. I guess that's the end of the story. But Jesus says, no, yes, I'm, I'm dead, but no, I ain't going to stay dead. And the stone rolls away and he walks out and not only, not only did he just rise from the dead, he rose from the dead, ascended to heaven, and then invites all of us into that victory with him. So it's because of that accomplishment that Jesus has given us that we are now seated with him. If you trust in him, seated with him in the heavenly places, you can speak to any grave, any dead end, anything in your life and 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 say that's not what it means. That may have happened, but that's not where it's going to stay. That's not what it means. Because Jesus has the last word. (sighs) Last couple of weeks, I've been um, grieving with a a friend of mine and her family. uh, I, I went to high school with this gal named Vivian. And she, this last year, was diagnosed with a fairly aggressive cancer. And uh, as conventional treatments failed, she kind of in a last-ditch effort raised some money to go to Mexico and try some alternative treatments. So there was a, a Facebook page created for, for Vivian, and there, one, her sister went down there with her and for three weeks just saying how she's doing, and it's obvious that she's going downhill, downhill, downhill. So time comes for them to come home and they, they had to stop in Calgary on the way back from Winnipeg, and she got put into ICU because she, she was suffocating because her lungs were filling up and they weren't working and all kinds of stuff. And so as I'm, as I'm reading this news, I don't even really know her that well. My heart just, oh, just went out to her and her family. And so I pulled out an old document that I had written, and it's called Dying Practice. And I can share it with you if you'd like um, at some point. Essentially what it is, is it, it, it's, a, it's a collection of scriptures that walk you through what happens when you die and, and what you'll see when you, when, you, when, you, when you get to heaven if you know Jesus and, and what heaven will be like. And the whole thing is, is to fill your mind with pictures of glory and of paradise and of, of joy and peace and the promises of God that await you if you put your faith in Christ. And I said, I, I, know that, I know that Vivian is a, is a believer in Jesus, but I just, I wrote on this page and I uploaded the, 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 the document. I said, I would so love it though if one of you could just read this to her. And I said, I know Jesus can heal her. I know, but I had this sense like this is probably it. So um, I got a um, middle of the week, an update on Facebook that Vivian had passed away. And one of her friends posted that she had grabbed that document and had read it to her on her deathbed. And, and family and friends were there as they read it and said, this is just an, this incredibly emotional time. And that day, the, the Facebook news spread, right, of Vivian's passing. And, and one other girl that we graduated with posted uh, you know, it's with great sadness that I want to I want to tell you that today Vivian lost her battle to cancer, and, and I actually replied, and I, I did it as nicely as I could, but I said I disagree. She didn't lose her battle to cancer. Vivian won. Her, her body failed, but her heart was strong. Her faith was strong. And she's with Jesus now in glory. She wins. She wins. Death does not have the final word. She didn't lose. She won. Not because of something she did, but because of what Jesus had done for her and the fact that she had put her faith in Jesus. She wins. She wins. She wins. So then the, the cool thing, too, is that I, I found out that the family found that so special that they asked that girl her, 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 to read dying practice at the memorial service to hundreds of people who now get to hear that good news. And, and I'm, not, I'm not trying to build myself up. Honestly, I'm, all I'm saying is all I tried to do was I was looking at what was there. I spoke love into what was missing. 
and I let them do with it as they pleased. And because they chose to cling to the words of Jesus, hope entered that room, light entered that room, and it's spreading now in, 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 these, in the lives of these people. So I want to encourage you, I want to encourage you to, to do this this week. Please, if you haven't already started to do this in your life, maybe you used to do this and you've stopped But instead of just letting your life unfold and just accepting the conclusions, the the first thing that comes to your mind about what it means, which will tend to be negative, they will, I want to encourage you to say, yes, that happened, but no, this isn't what it means. Jesus gets the last word, period. Period. 